Hello everyone, my name is Spooky Dude, and today I'd like to try a brand new kind of video. Rather than waste 15 minutes talking to you about a theory I can summarize my opinion on in 2 minutes, why not do a rapid fire theory review, similar to the meme review format where I go through popular theories one by one and give my personal thoughts on them. So that's what I've gone ahead and done. In front of me I have a list of popular theories, some more popular than others, that I'm going to go through rapid fire and give my thoughts on. I even have a few theories sent to me by fans to review, which I highly appreciate. If you want a theory in a future theory review video, send it to me at spookydudetheories at gmail.com. My name is Spooky Dude. make sure to like, subscribe, and follow me on Twitter. Now let's get started. The first theory I'd like to talk about is whether or not Ralsei is sus, or is hiding something. I think this is the one that I certainly can't give a definitive yes or no to, since we know so little in the grand scheme of things. However, I do have a very strong opinion about it. The things that people consider sus about Ralsei are how he appears out of nowhere in the cyber world, indicating he may have traveled through the light world, how he doesn't turn to stone in the cyber world, how he has secret conversations with Chris, how he doesn't know what being Ralsei-like even is, and of course, how his name is an anagram of Asriel, as well as him seeming so very similar to Asriel. First things first, lots of people claim that Ralsei is completely separate from Asriel, and isn't meant to represent him at all. I highly disagree with this notion. This game wasn't written in a vacuum, it was written with us, the audience, in mind. And that Ralsei reveal at the end of Chapter 1 was 100% meant to make us think of Asriel. Not only that, but his name being an anagram is totally not a coincidence. That would be just crazy. As for his strange ability to exist in the cyber world, as well as seemingly fast travel there, I think there are two potential explanations. Either yes, he is hiding something totally crazy, and can magically travel through the light world, or there's very retconish explanations like, oh, he's made of pure darkness, or oh, the dark worlds are connected. Both of these explanations I'm not the biggest fan of, but they both technically could be valid answers. Last but not least, I think that his conversations with Chris certainly aren't unimportant. They're obviously talking about something important, otherwise the game wouldn't act the way it does in regards to these conversations. And that's the thing, and my opinion on Ralsei. I highly doubt Ralsei is super evil and is plotting the destruction of the world, and there's a high chance that Ralsei isn't hiding anything. However, I would say, at the end of the day, yes, Ralsei is suspicious. Forgetting about established lore for a second, as well as character motivations, this game and the things you're supposed to feel are controlled by Toby Fox and the developers. The question should be, does Toby want us to be suspicious of Ralsei? And when you ask it that way, the answer is a definitive yes. Ralsei's actions may be able to be explained, but Toby absolutely wants us to feel that there's more going on with him. Many hardcore theorizers may have a hard time doing so, however, most casual fans all believe the same thing. Ralsei is hiding something. I've seen firsthand people in my life play the game casually and assume that Ralsei is hiding something or evil, and that's because the game has been written in such a way that causes us to believe it. Because Toby wants us to be suspicious of him. So again, while he may not be hiding anything, or be super evil, I'd say that yes, Ralsei should be considered suspicious, as obviously, Toby wants us to be suspicious of him. This isn't real life, this is a story, and at the heart of any story is the feelings and emotions that are meant to be drawn from you, guided by the hand of the storyteller. Analyzing a game for three years leads to logic being applied when there doesn't need to be. In this case, the game has been written to have Ralsei periodically send up some video game character red flags. The next theory I'd like to talk about is chess theory. For those that don't know, chess theory is a kind of controversial theory that states that the bosses of Deltarune are going to be chess pieces in descending order in terms of importance and point value. This means that the order would be King, Queen, Rook, Bishop, Knight, Pawn. Many theorists fill in the gaps and assume that the player would be the final boss in Chapter 7. This theory is lambasted for many reasons. Many say it would hinder Toby's creativity, that he'd be limiting himself. Others believe it's too convoluted, or think that Mike or Tenna are proof that chess theory is dead. In my opinion, that's not necessarily the case. I do believe that at least until Chapter 6, chess theory is going to be correct. There's too much that lines up perfectly for it to be false. King only took one step at a time, like a king in chess. Queen was able to move wherever, and literally tried to use pawn promotion to make a pawn into a knight. It can't get any more clearer than that. I think that Chapter 4 is most likely going to take place at a church, leaving perfect room for the bishop to be the boss. And I think Chapter 6 and 7 will be very different from the rest of the game. 
And what better way to build up hype than by ending Chapter 5 with a knight fight, prior to a huge story moment. Maybe the roaring, maybe the true villain reveals themselves. Either way, there's a lot of ways chess theory actually works. As for Toby limiting himself, I don't really think that's accurate. After all, King and Queen were very unique. Toby's able to take a name like Rook, for example, and make them into very interesting characters. I'm sure that three characters named Rook, Bishop, and the already named Knight are able to be fun, interesting characters. Now, as for Mike and Tenna, who many believe at least one to be the main boss, and to that, I ask you to humor me for a second. If you had learned about Jevil, Shaum, and Rules prior to Chapter 1, surely you'd have thought one of them was the main boss. A strange shopkeeper who knows more than he lets on, an insane clown who was locked away for knowing too much, a puzzle master whose puzzles always seem to fail. All three sound like they could be main bosses. Just because we know of two characters who are important to Chapter 3 doesn't mean Rook can't exist. Not only that, but there are tons of more interesting chess strategies Toby could use as in-game story elements. For example, I don't, I'm going to pronounce this wrong, but Tarash rule states that a rook could hide behind its own pawn or its opponent's pawn in the late game, something that surely can be used to interesting effect in Chapter 3. In my opinion, we've seen enough to know that chess theory is most likely correct, but not as a strict set of guidelines that must be followed, more so a thematic story element Toby is using excellently. The next theory I'd like to talk about is the very common belief that rules is going to be a secret boss. I think this is a super fun idea, and honestly there's a lot to suggest Rules is a bit more important than we think. Take for example the hint that Rules' true power was going to be unleashed before he quickly turned to stone. Toby has a track record for surprising secret bosses based on characters you wouldn't suspect, so I don't think this is the most insane idea. But based on the hints we've already gotten, I don't think this would be played for the surprise factor. It's also worth mentioning that following the trend of secret bosses being thrown away or discarded, the rules card is often discarded when opening up a new pack of cards. I think rules definitely fits for some kind of secret boss fight, but I also can't help but mention. He says his goal is to serve the most evil ruler. In Snowgrave, there's a big chance that rules may follow us instead of fighting us. I do think, however, that Shaum has a much higher chance of being a secret boss than rules. His build-up so far throughout the story has been similar to Sans. He's very apathetic, believing that the ending is coming and we can't stop it, and is supposedly much stronger than we think, strong enough to beat Jevil. It's also been hinted at by the Undertale cross-stitch book, of all things, which reveals the Seam Ripper, the important part being essential for ripping out a misaligned stitch if you're too far along to simply pull the threads back out, once wielded by Shaum in combat. This seems like an obvious hint of sorts that Shaum is going to end up as a secret boss. One really fun interpretation that I saw on Reddit is that the reason Shaum knows that we won't be able to change the future and seems to have a very nihilistic outlook is because he'll try and stop us, and he knows we could never beat him. I don't think I necessarily believe that, but it's still a really fun thought. Something that's irked me is that both Shaum and Rules have heavy symbolic ties to Gaster. Now you may say it's a coincidence, and it very well could be, but for a game that seems so heavily invested in hinting at Gaster, especially that first chapter, I really don't think that it's a coincidence. Shaum's cut going down his one eye, with the other eye almost being that same shape as Gaster's. His lines across his mouth, Rules' face, which inverted, looks just like Gaster, with the line going across his mouth as well. I mean, it could be a coincidence, but it's just really odd. To be honest, you could get really crazy with it. A nihilistic shopkeeper with great power, and a tall and somewhat silly puzzle master who has unrealistic goals he wants to meet? Sounds familiar. Hmm. I joke, but in all seriousness, I wouldn't be surprised if either Rules, Shaum, or both have a boss battle or lore-relevant secrets about them. Next up is a theory sent to me by Elliot. Thanks for the submission! Again, if you want to submit a theory, send it to SpookyDudeTheories at gmail.com, and I might put it in my next theory review. Elliot asks if I can give my thoughts on... Al Gaylord? Who? So, this is really fascinating. I did some research, and, and this is actually a really interesting fact that I didn't know. If you remember correctly, the Spanton Sweepstakes features Noelle's blog, in which she describes strange events that happened to her while playing games, facts about her life, and some experiences with Susie and Chris. Her email is holidaygirl1225, that's like her, uh, her handle on that site. And apparently, if you send an email to holidaygirl1225 at gmail.com, there is an automated reply. 
I tested it for myself and, oh wow, it really works. Interesting. An email reply comes back saying, I am not home right now. Sorry, you can still email me, though I have a laptop. Huh. First off, there's always the chance that this may not be Toby, but I doubt that. Just keep that in mind. What's interesting about this email, though, isn't the contents, but who it's from. It sounds to me like the email itself is uh, the same kind of writing style as Noelle when she was much younger. But it says here the email is from Al Gaylord. Huh. I don't know of any characters named that. Putting it through an anagram solver, which <laughs> you kind of have to do for all secrets in Deltarune at this point, gets us only one real result. Alligator. It's really odd that this is the email we received back from Noelle, who's certainly not an alligator. I guess this leaves me with three interesting options. Either A, this is a teaser for an alligator character whose name is Al Gaylord. This is just Noelle being odd and silly by having this as her name and means nothing for the future of Deltarune. Or, this is meant to imply that we're receiving the email from Braddy, or act as a Braddy teaser. All three options are definitely possible, and I really like the idea that Braddy and Caddy will get some serious screen time. If I had to guess, I'd bet that Chapter 4 will have Braddy, Caddy, and Jockington. That'd be a fun pairing. And of course, the weird route implications for that are certainly something. Before I get to my final theory, I feel like I have to mention Weasel Weasel W, another fan who sent me a fantastic, very in-depth theory. First off, I want to say thanks for the theory. I was planning on talking about it, but then something kind of surprising happened. I'm writing this massive theory that aims to answer most questions in the game. Is it kind of nuts? Yeah, totally. It's insane. It's, it's huge. Is it true? I, I think that everything lines up. This theory that I'm working on kind of all, everything, all the boxes are checked. It really does work in my head, but you know, I'm not sure if it's at that level yet. I'm working on it. I'm thinking about it. It's going to take me some time, but this theory sent to me by Weasel Weasel W kind of lines up perfectly with a lot of the points in that theory. I have a, this theory is, uh, it has large lore implications about where Deltarune is going and how Gaster will play into it, and this theory that I was sent just so happens to touch on most things I want to talk about in that video. So I think I'll save this theory for that massive video. Not to get too ahead of myself, but I think that video has the chance to genuinely solve most of Deltarune's major mysteries. So thank you for the theory submission, but I'm going to save it for that big video. Now to talk about the final theory for this video. Why did Chris open the Dark World at the end of Chapter 2? This, honestly, has confused so many people since it happened. I have a lot of thoughts about this. First off, lots of people seem to think that it's to either alert Undyne and Toriel as to what's going on, go on another fun adventure with Susie, coaxing the knight in, or a combination of the three. I hate all of these theories. I really do. I don't mean to be a jerk about it, but all three just seem so convoluted. Especially as, you know, what we know about Chris. First off, this cutscene happens after the weird route as well. I highly doubt Chris would want to go on another fun adventure after Chapter 2's Nightmare of a Journey. Second, why would they automatically assume the knight would come running if they open a dark world? That makes zero sense considering the fact that we don't even know the knight's goals. I personally don't think they're trying to cause the roaring, as they've been going inside the dark worlds and heavily influencing them. That doesn't make sense if they're trying to cause the roaring. Regardless, regardless, whether or not they're attempting to cause the roaring, there's no reason to believe that they'd A, want to enter the Dark World, or B, even know that the Dark World was open. Finally, if they want to alert Undyne and Toriel to either the Dark Worlds or what's going on with the soul, there are so many ways to do it. Wake up Toriel, point out the big heart in the couch instead of stabbing into the ground. Wait for Toriel and Undyne to be there, awake, and then show them the opening of the Dark World. I get that they tried with Undyne, but opening up a Dark World when everyone is asleep isn't going to help anything. Noelle and Birdley fully believed it was a dream, so why wouldn't Toriel and Undyne say the same? Now, what do I think Chris was doing? I think there's one of two answers. First off, Chris could simply have large-scale intentions that we don't know about. They're obviously very mysterious, and know things we don't. Obviously, they've had an entire life before we showed up. I wouldn't be surprised if they know about what happened to Des or something about Asriel they aren't telling us. Perhaps they have their own, long-term plan reasons for opening a dark world that'll be shown to us eventually. However, I do have a second option. What if Chris is opening a dark world because they are the Knight? I know this is going to cause problems, but stick with me for one second. The only evidence we really have against the idea that Chris is not the Knight 
is that the Chapter 2 Dark World was opened after Birdly and Noelle sat down and began working, implying it couldn't have been Chris. I highly disagree with this notion. There is very little consistency when it comes to Dark World rules so far. In Chapter 1, our characters walk around the Dark World and end up in a physically different space in the Light World after the adventure. Birdly and Noelle show up sitting down and studying. Why? Why in Chapter 1 do our characters move in the Light World, when in Chapter 2, characters don't move at all? As said by the man himself, Toby Fox, he's simply not that consistent with little things like this. Yeah, when it comes to little lore, he often sprinkles in details that are very thoroughly thought out. But oftentimes, he'll sacrifice deep lore details for the sake of the story. Why did rules take longer to turn into stone than Lancer? Because Toby wanted a rules boss fight. Simple. You demonstrate the stone mechanic with Lancer, then you have the rules fight. But then why, in the weird route, does he fully turn to stone? Could weird route stuff be secretly affecting the will of the fountain? No, it's because it's a silly rules fight, and that would not fit the tone of the weird route. This, in my opinion, is no different. The reason that Noelle and Birdly are sitting in the chairs when they wake up is so that they can reasonably believe that they were studying and fell asleep. Not to act as proof that the dark world was opened by someone hiding in the closet, and it couldn't be Chris, and that they must have done all their night stuff with an exit, and... This is just another example of that. Chris being the knight seems to be heavily hinted at. They're literally a knight. Sure, there's a lot of minor details or circumstantial evidence that seem to point towards Chris not being the knight, but the game hasn't definitively said anything about it yet. Most casual fans automatically assume that Chris is indeed the knight by the end of Chapter 2, and I think that's most important when analyzing where Deltarune is and where it's going. Remember what I said before about Ralse and what Toby wants us to think? That applies here as well. Toby is trying to make us, the players, believe that Chris is the knight, and we shouldn't ignore that. The aim of a game developer, the feelings they want us to have, the theories they want to plant in our minds, that's the most important thing in a game like this. The kinds of things that years of analysis tend to overwrite. A movie that exemplifies this belief of mine is Knives Out. Knives Out is a murder mystery movie directed by Ryan Johnson. It's very, very knowledgeable about the genre it belongs to, and also understands that the audience will be as well. At the end of the day, the big reveal of Knives Out isn't some mind-boggling, world-ending surprise, it's rather tame in comparison. But what makes Knives Out one of the best murder mystery movies that I've seen is because of the journey to get to that reveal. Not once throughout the entire movie did I suspect the real killer, and that's because the movie tries to be two steps ahead of you at all times. The characters will imply that character A did it, while subtext and well-placed hints indicate that it was actually character B. Ah, I said, I figured it out, I'm smarter than you, movie. It was character B. But it was a trap. Knives Out knows you'll try and piece it together, and so it purposefully puts clues all around so that you're on the same level as the detective the entire time. The feeling, the beliefs, and the theories that you have in your brain are the feelings, beliefs, and theories that the movie wants you to have. Now, if I paused the movie a quarter of the way in by analyzing every detail, I'd be able to piece together something. Maybe the truth, but definitely not what the movie wants us to think. If I had two years to think on it, I'd absolutely recognize the fact that it couldn't have been character B, and that perhaps it's a different character. By the time the two years passed, I would have had a completely different feeling about the movie going into it. I'd be able to tear down the specific feelings and theories that are meant to be felt, but in doing so, I'd be actively ruining the experience for myself. Theories aren't bad at all, don't get me wrong, but denying everything that the movie, or in this case, game, is trying to tell us using video game language can hurt the experience. I think that at this point in time, Toby Fox wants the prime candidate of who the knight is to be Chris. This scene, while it could later on be explained, was meant to make players all collectively go, I figured it out, Chris is the knight, it's been spelled out for us. So that's the video. This ended up being much bigger than I anticipated, so I hope you enjoyed it. Please make sure to subscribe, like, follow me on Twitter, and stay tuned for more Deltarune content. My name is Spooky Dude, and thanks for watching.